but we have two uh, more speakers in this panel uh, that are focused, they're primarily, um, the theme of this panel is about trust in artificial agents. And so we'll have uh, Jason DeCruz to start us off uh, from University of Albany, and then Penn State's own Alan Wagner from Aerospace Engineering and the Rock Ethics Institute um, to talk about uh, trust in robots. So whenever you're ready. Thanks so much, Daryl, for organizing this whole thing and um, the entire um, Expanding Empathy series. Um, I really am confident that it's going to be agenda setting for a lot of this research. So really exciting. And um, yeah, thank you. To advance, uh, just click. OK, good. Um, so just start off acknowledging that uh, this is collaborative work I'm performing, I'm describing today. And um, these are my collaborators, so Will Kidder, uh, my former uh, advisee and Kush Varshney at IBM Research. And what I presented today is based on a couple of different papers we have, uh, the, empathy, the Empathy Gap and Empathy and the Right to Be an Exception. Okay, so starting off with that kind of vignette uh, story to give you a picture of the sort of thing I'm interested in. Um, so this is uh, an advice column from the Guardian newspaper. Um, a woman wrote in talking about her uh, low credit score um, that she had as a result of being in an abusive relationship um, where her controlling partner um, uh, prevented her from um, um, repaying a loan as she had intended. So she writes to Anna Timms, the advice columnist, um, in 2016, a default was registered in my credit file by my bank after I missed three payments of my student loan, of my student overdraft. I now want to buy a home, but I am unable to get a mortgage because of the default. This is keeping my son and me stuck in rented accommodation that we can all afford. Then we have Anna Tim's uh, empathic reply. So what she says, this is a heart-rending story which exposes the shortcomings of the credit reporting system. Credit reports show the default without the circumstances in which cases such as yours are crucial and you can't usually remove it until you prove an error. And so notice here that the credit scoring algorithm registered the missed payments, but it's Tim's that, Tim's that apprehends the reasons for the missed payments. And Tim's recognizes that the author of the letter is in an excusing condition. So being bullied and, and um, abused is an excusing condition for failing to meet this um, financial commitment. So what I want to bring out here is the distinction between getting better at forecasting behavior and getting better at assessing trustworthiness. And to point out, I guess, what's kind of a, in some ways an obvious point, but I think a really important one, is that getting better at forecasting behavior doesn't ipso facto mean that we're getting better at understanding people's trustworthiness. So for the purposes of accurate forecasting and the efficient uh, allocation of resources, it doesn't matter whether this person's explanation of the default is a morally excusing explanation or not. Um, but from her perspective, the diminishment of her credit score in excusing conditions is really unjust. And so what Tim's was able to do that the credit scoring algorithm was not able to do was to empathize with this person's position. She puts herself in this person's shoes and she invites her readers to do the same. Um, and this is a way of recognizing the reader, at, recognizing the writer of the letter as an individual with unique, um, with a unique perspective and a set of experiences. Okay, so the kind of social phenomenon that um, I'm trying to bring attention to is that to a greater and greater extent, decisions that are made about what kinds of opportunities are afforded to people or withdrawn to people are going to be made on forecasts of people's behavior. So uh, data-driven forecasts of people's behavior. So are you going to be extended a loan? Are you going to be granted bail? Are you going to be approved for work from home accommodations? Um, are you going to be able to take a test online? Um, and I think that even though these are presented just as forecasts of predictions of how people are going to behave, um, we naturally interpret these kinds of decisions that preclude us from important opportunities um, as derogations of our moral character. So you are too risky to be afforded this kind of opportunity. 
Um, but in general, we want judgments about whether we're going to be trusted to be sensitive to whether we deserve to be trusted or not. That is how committed we are to doing the thing that, we're, that we say that we're going to do, um, um, how capable we are of doing the thing that, we're going to, that we say we're going to do. Um, so these kind of judgments have got to take motivations into consideration. They've got to take into consideration context. Um, and intuitively, um, they are apprehended by other humans via the method of empathy. That is projecting ourselves into other people's um, perspectives. So in particular, I'm interested in cases in which people take themselves to be an exception. So you've done something that appears bad, appears to illustrate some kind of bad moral character. But you think that you're in a certain kind of excusing condition where what appears to be really bad isn't that way. So the kind of signature lament to say something like, I see why this looks bad, but my case is different. Try to see things from my point of view. That is, um, so first you express empathy. You project yourself into the perspective of the person who's judging you. You say, I see why this looks bad, right? I understand your perspective on what just happened. And then you invite them to take up your perspective on what's happened. Um, so what I want to kind of point out is that just knowing a person's track record is essential, but it's not sufficient. Um, so we've got to interpret that track record somehow. And I think often empathy is a tool that we use, cognitive empathy, to interpret that track record. So what are the person's reasons, motivations, justifications for what they're doing? Um, and when we take others to lack insight into what our motives are, then that is good reason to be skeptical about their capacity to make assessments of our um, trustworthiness. So they only see us from the outside instead of taking into consideration our mental life. So you might think, well, maybe empathic AI is to the rescue. So that we've got this problem of algorithmic decision making. Algorithmic decision making is just making predictions about behavior. Um, people are interpreting these predictions of behavior as derogations of character. What we need is systems that say something about people's internal states. And it seems like well, LLMs are getting better at attributing beliefs, desires, intentions, emotions. And we can only expect that they're going to um, continue to get better. So would this be an improvement? So if they can eventually describe the motivations of behavior at a level that's equal or superior to that of human judges, then should we just be confident in their assessments of trustworthiness um, and um, not be so troubled by the fact that, to a growing extent, the opportunities that are afforded to people or drawn from people are made based on um, decisions that are supported by AI, if it's empathic AI that's um, in part behind them. So think about the kind of case where you're making your case to an LLM. So you have applied for a job. Um, the system screens your CV and your cover letter and looks for similarities between, say, people who have been successful at that job before and your CV and your cover letter, make some sorts of decisions about who to interview. Um, imagine you're rejected by the system, um, but you think that you've been wrongly overlooked by it. Um, so maybe there are certain aspects of your resume that require some kind of nuanced understanding. Maybe there's a long gap in employment on your resume, but the explanation for that gap is that you were taking care of a relative who was um, ill, and that's why you didn't work for those, for those years. Suppose you can actually just make that case to an LLM instead of a person. So you're providing it with explanations in the same kind of a way that you might plead your case to a human being. And suppose the LLM can also express itself in a way that makes you feel seen, heard, and understood. I'm interested in the question is, is there anything left to want after we've got this kind of thing? Um, and the LLM isn't you know, deploying the method of empathy in the way that a human being would deploy the method of empathy, does the method of empathy have any kind of intrinsic value to it? So one thing to notice when I say uh, we call these systems empathic systems, and they do you know, sometimes exhibit empathic accuracy. They're, they're good at um, accurately attributing beliefs and intentions to people, but they're not doing any affective matching, right? There's nothing it's like to be the LLM, and the LLM is not mirroring your experience anyway. Um, and 
their abilities, which I mean, they're surprisingly good at, these abilities are sometimes surprisingly good, but they're doing it via predicting language tokens. They're not imagining a person's perspective. So the method is very different. We might arrive at the same outcomes, but the method is very different. And what I'm interested in is whether the method matters. Is there any kind of intrinsic worth to the method of empathy? Is there a reason to um, value it in particular? So here are a couple reasons why we might think empathy matters in honoring what we call in the paper the right to be an exception. So one is, I think that's come up a few times uh, today in, in, the, in the talks, is that empathic effort can be a way of signaling respect and care. So expressions of empathy that are just on tap, that are effortless, that are it, the infinite resources of empathy, don't have this signaling power um, to show respect and care. Um, maybe another reason why thinking that the method of empathy is particularly important is that affect sharing can be evidence of understanding and appreciation. So you're trying to make the case to someone that, look, my case is different. It's not as bad as it seems. Um, they may end up thinking, like, you're not actually in excusing conditions. I can understand why you behave that way, but you're not actually in excusing conditions. We may see, look for signs that a person's actually moved by our story as evidence that they really understand and appreciate it. Um, and we can't get that kind of evidence from systems that um, don't have any kinds of experiences themselves that can't effectively match. So that might be some reason for thinking that um, the method of empathy is particularly important for honoring the right to be an exception. Um, there might be other reasons as well. Um, accountability is also um, a reason why we might think that a human, it's important to be able to appeal ultimately to a human judge for these, uh, uh, on these important matters. So I'm going to end on just a couple of avenues that I think are interesting avenues for research, both for psychologists and for philosophers. Um, so the first is for the psychologists. It's an empirical avenue of research. So how important is it for decision subjects that the decision maker be capable of imaginally adopting their point of view and sharing their emotions? And when is mere empathic accuracy um, sufficient? And we might want to think about you know, different kinds of cases where you know, either we're trying to make a decision about work from home accommodation versus we're trying to decide an asylum case. And we might get very different responses about how much people care that their appeal is made to something that can share their perspective or um, share their emotion. So I think you know, this is an open question that we really want to learn more about. And the second is a kind of normative question for, for the ethicists. Um, so, Laboring to understand a person's full individuality is aware, uh, is a way of respecting them, of honoring them, of caring for them. And we should think about what the societal implications are um, when we outsource these kinds of decisions to, um, to AI systems that uh, don't have the same kinds of capacities and don't engage in the same kinds of methods. Thanks, that was an awesome talk. Um, so I wanna uh, press a little bit on the like method, right? It's just doing next token prediction, so it can't do it in the same way. Yeah. So here's an argument that people make about next token prediction um, that you know maybe the best way to predict the next token is to build a detailed model of the domain that you're trying to predict the next token in. Mm. So if you're imagining in the not too distant future, we have very kind of personalized LLMs. And sure, all they're doing is next token prediction, but they've done it on the basis of you know months, even years of detailed interaction with the LLMs, inferences based on you know, purchase history, medical records, right? All these things. Yeah. I guess I'm just wondering if you think it's like in principle impossible that next token prediction could ever get us that method of empathy. Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't think that any of that kind of maybe, if you think there's background model building that's going on with um, next token prediction, I don't think that gets us 
anywhere in the direction of affective matching. Um, but it might get us in the direction of um, other oriented perspective taking, right? Um, so if you think that that's what's going on, if, if um, next token prediction requires building up these background models, then maybe there is something like perspective taking going on. Um, and I really don't know what to say about that, that argument that next token prediction really is building up these background models. Um, I haven't made up my mind about it, so um, I had to, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. Um, so I share the uh, intuition about sort of the more empathetic way of going about it in the human case as like being normatively very important and like it, demonstrating care. Um, but I'm wondering how much of that was happening before <laughs> such that this is like how much is this really a radical change right like just because uh human beings were sorting through 250 resumes for the first round cut as opposed to mm -hmm. amazon's resume uh search function algorithm right yeah. uh so i just wonder it's like yeah I, I totally agree that this is bad but it's not obvious i i, I mean i gather this is mostly an empirical question it's not obvious to me sitting here that like it that much of a change. I think human beings in bureaucracies probably weren't extending the kind of really empathetic, detailed, and energy intensive empathy anyway. So yeah, good yeah. point. Good point. Um, so I have a colleague at um, a law school who's really interested in deploying these models to make uh, or support decisions about asylum cases. Um, and in that case, I'm thinking that having the right to make your appeal to a human being is going to be super important and um, you know, people are um, dishonored and they're not cared for um, when they don't have the right to make their appeal to a human being in that kind of a case when it comes to the early sorting of cv cases um, i'm not sure that yeah we ever do it and i think you're, you're totally right about it so it's going to vary from from case to case i was just going to say and then i'll Josh, there was a paper by, I think, Phil Parnamets and colleagues looking at not asylum cases, but like refugee decisions mm -hmm. um, and looking at, I think it was like a naturalistic work and like, a, I think it was like the Swedish refugee, like one of the main decision making bodies that decide, that makes these um, decisions. Um, and it looked at like issues of fatigue and burnout and like the difficulty of making such decisions. And many wonder, you know, the role of effort. And I mean, I, I get the point about like the singularity of effort if it's for your case specifically. But I mean, part of one of the interesting things about what Nikki mentioned earlier, the explorations of chat GPT and, you know, often empathy makes us, you know, prioritize the one over the many in a way that can be unfair. And I think yeah. the fact that it could be more principled and allow us to, and maybe this goes to part of your point, Brett, about like sustaining certain kinds of moral agency in humans. Is there a way we can use it to buffer ourselves against the kind of fatigue that we see in real world human contexts and kind of outsource the, the labor yeah, it does seem like there's some sometimes is a kind of trade off um, where the AI system might be more accurate, uh, will be less biased, there'll be less noise, and sometimes that matters enormous amount. Um, and then there are also other, you know, I think equally important considerations of recognition, of respect, of humane care. Um, that matter. And sometimes it's going to be a trade off between those things. And I think it makes sense to think about ways in which human beings can collaborate with AI systems to make decisions. Um, but still, I think that last appeal to a human being is, is morally important. Or they want the right outcome, yeah. right? So I think it's yeah, yeah. they wanted the correct, quote unquote, the correct outcome. Um, and if they're rejected by a human who's legitimately, effortfully empathizing, they're still going to be pissed off and not seen as a human. That's right. Uh, rejection in either case is going to be is going to be terrible. But I do think there's something distinctly worse about the rejection by an AI system for a high stakes decision than rejection by a human being. I mean, there's always a chance that. The human being will say, no, your case is not exceptional. Your case falls under the rule. The differences in your case don't merit it being treated any differently. Um, and you know, that's 
always going to be um, that's always going to be dissatisfying. But I think it's a, of a different order than when a machine makes a determination about your fate um, that has made no effort to take up your point of view. There's nothing that's made an effort to take up your point of view, and um, there's no affect sharing, um, and there's no one to hold responsible either. It does seem like the, the kinds of, so people are gonna be angry in either case where they're rejected, um, where they have an adverse decision, but there seems to be something really different yes, about sir. the adverse decision that comes from the United Not to live the point, but my, my suspicion is that um, people then they have a better chance with a human. They think they're gonna, their, their exceptionality will come through. I, they're wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, it's the same thing with like, you know, this old research on algorithm aversion. People do not like to be evaluated by you know, uh, algorithms, not even machines, just like mm -hmm. statistical calculations, because they, they don't think their full humanity is seen. Um, so anyhow. Yeah, yeah. One of the cool things, and I'll give it to Josh, then we'll switch to Alan. Uh, one of the cool things from the paper that uh, came up in a couple different talks, you mentioned it and you mentioned it as well, the, the it's a yin and walks lock paper. They have this varied finding about empathic effort and how um, AI was rated as exerting more empathic effort than the human cases. And they don't really talk about it much, but it, it is yeah. interesting. I want to dig into their data set and kind of explore that because they have all these variables about like feeling heard, so they, they had people rate, uh, I hope it do the methodology justice, but they basically, they found that AI responses were rated as having exerted higher effort than human responses. So it's an interesting, like, just an interesting comparison. It's like the last supplemental table in their paper, but it raises a lot of questions, I think, for this very point. Thank you, and thank you for a really great talk. Um, I have a question that follows up on all of the questions that have been asked. Um, where I, I think some of the difficulty in this kind of next token prediction might be due to these failures to perspective take and think about mental states rather than dispositions. But I wonder if there's also more of a recapitulation of other kind of more classic social psychological biases of like the fundamental attribution error where these algorithms just aren't taking into account the situation, um, and so there are there are more dispositional inferences being made, which this is kind of a classic thing that we do when we don't know other people and, and that increases for strangers and as we get to know people more, as we have more details about that individual, then we're less likely to make that kind of error. Yeah. Um, so it might, it, there might be ways around empathizing that could also get to this realization that your case is different. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there's, so there might be ways of like, that could be a correctable problem for AI where um, we want to design systems that are less susceptible to making something like the fundamental attribution error and um, look more carefully at circumstances. And we can imagine the design of AI systems that do that, that look more carefully at circumstances. And I'm imagining that we will get better at that. Um, and then the question is, is there anything left over that's worth wanting? And I think that there is, um, but it's hard to articulate exactly why, if you get better and more accurate judgments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. All right, next up we have Alan Wagner uh, from Aerospace Engineering in the Rock here at Penn State. <laughs> well, thank you, Daryl. Um, so this is gonna be very different from the other talks. Um, I'm a roboticist first, AI researcher second, um, I suppose, um, ethics and machine ethics third would be sort of the role, um, the sort of organization of my research. Um, this is work that's been carried over several different years. And um, my lab, one of the things that we try to do is develop robots um, that can lead people out of um, emergencies, um, evacuate people from buildings, um, and try to understand how trust uh, is influenced um, in a human-robot interaction in an emergency. So why do we want to use robots to, for evacuation? I mean, the ultimate goal is for survivability. You could have robots cleaning the floor in here. Oh, speaking of the mic, yeah, OK. Um, we could have robots cleaning the floor in here. And if some sort of uh, emergency occurred, the robots could lead us to the exits. Um, if we have a bigger building or a school or a hospital, robots could contribute by providing situation awareness to uh, first responders 
They could reduce the response time to almost immediately in active shooting scenario or situations. Um, and ideally sort of uh, decrease the risk to um, both the people in the environment and uh, first responders. Um, High-rise buildings and fires are a sort of important application area. So some of the first work, first questions that we've sort of focused on here is, will people trust a robot during an emergency? Um, you know, it's, it was sort of an open question. You know, you have a robot, a robot shows up and says, follow me. Are you going to follow the, that robot? And are you going to follow it if you're smelling smoke or if you're seeing a fire or if you're hearing gunfire in the hallway? Um, I think a lot of people sort of naively would say, no, I, I'm not going to follow that. But what our research shows is that, in fact, a large, substantial portion of people actually do follow the robot's guidance, even if the robot's proven itself untrustworthy. Um, so just quickly, based on some of the work by Mayer, you know, our, our definition of trust here is focused on um, sort of, it's a very roboticized version um, it's a belief held by a trustor that the trustee is going to act in a manner that mitigates the trustor's risk. And so for us um, to consider and um, discuss and, and code things related to trust, we have to consider the, the risks taken and the minimization of the risk and the idea that the robot would minimize that risk. Um, I always relate trust to um, the, the um, trust fall here. And, you know, in the classic trust ball, you have the, the trustor who's doing the leaning. You have the trustee who's, you know, catching them and in the situation. So the way I typically de describe this is, you know, in the trust ball, the person who's leaning back is, is accepting some risk that they're not going to be dropped. Um, now, the estimation of that risk depends on a lot of the factors of the trustor. So if, if the last, to last 10 times they did uh, a trust fall, uh, they were dropped, then they're going to estimate the risk is higher than someone who's often been caught. Or, um, it all, the, the amount of risk also depends on the trustee, so the person catching them. So in this case, you have you know, a pretty strong-looking young person, but if the person catching them was you know, four years old or was 85 years old and had two broken arms, then the risk would be viewed as higher. And then finally, the situation. So they're, they're doing the trust fall over a a nice bed of lush grass, but you can imagine if it was done on a parking lot or a broken glass or when the Philadelphia Eagles won the, um, the uh, Super Bowl, people were doing trust falls from the second story building of a hotel onto a crowd. So that's some serious risk. Um, and so these factors come together and um, the person estimates the risk and makes a decision, ideally, right? At least that's sort of the mathematical way to look at it. Now, do people trust robots in risky situations? So with respect to trust, you know, ideally you have trust on, on the left here. That's how much risk I'm going to take and, and put in the trustee. And on trustworthiness on the bottom. So how much risk should I put in that person? And the line there is calibrated trust. So if, if I'm perfectly estimating how trustworthy the person is, then my trust will be calibrated. On the other hand, if I do not trust the person as much as they are trustworthy, then I'm under-trusting them. And when it comes to automation, this usually results in misuse. So for example, if you don't trust a piece of automation or a robot, people will just usually put it on their porch, or if it's in the military or in the field, they'll throw it in the back of the, the truck, the Humvee, leave it on the side of the road, never use it again. right? The opposite of that is when you take risks that a system cannot handle um, and is not trustworthy for, that's called overtrust. And this often leads to misuse, where you use the system in ways that it was not, it's not able to handle. You have expectations that it can do things that it can't do. You think that it has knowledge that it does not have. And it leads people to take risks that they shouldn't take, um, believing that the system will mitigate those risks. So our experiments have always looked at this, this paradigm here, or many of our experiments have, where we take subjects, human subjects, and we bring them in, into a room and we say, um, you know, thank you for coming to our experiment. This robot will guide you to some sort of meeting room. 
the robot guides them, and unbeknownst to them, some emergency occurs, and then they get to choose whether they follow the robot out or go their own way. And along the way, we have the robot make different mistakes to sort of show that it's not trustworthy. And then there's a survey. So here's an example from years ago of some one of the robots that we built. This was an, um, a robot that we called Emergy, and it would go down a hall and go to the right and take them to a, a meeting room. And here's an example of the robot making a mistake. And this is one of my graduate students, but uh, at the time, this is several years ago. But people would follow the robot just like he is. <laughs> this is how closely they follow the directions of you know, follow the robot. They go in circles with it. You know, then there's some directions, and then we filled the hall with smoke, and we would, um, you know, the alarms in the building would go off, right? And so they would, you know, go out the hall. Go ahead. Sorry about the loudness. Um, let's just show some of the smoke in this, this example. And they turn the hall, and they could go straight out the door, which they came, or they could follow the robot to the right and go in a different, unknown direction. And when we ran this experiment, we found that essentially everyone followed the robot, even when it made a mistake. Um, what happens when, um, this is what some people do when they open the door. So in this case, person's case, um, you know, this is something you want to put on Instagram, the smoke in the hallway, right? you know, show your friends. Um, but in this case, you know, you'll see a real sort of visceral uh, reaction from this subject, right? She backs up. Some people stand there in uncertainty of what to do. Um, and these are sort of hallmarks of, uh, of an emergency. Um, here's an example of the person just sort of standing there for some, for some time, right? Um, and, you know, so eventually they would all sort of wander out into the hallway because there's no person to ask. And when they encounter the robot, they all follow the robot. So you'll see him sort of not sure what to do, but then follow the robot. And this person's sort of running. Okay, and in another version of the ex experiment, we had the robot break down in the, right in, at that location, the decision location. And the experimenter goes up to them and says, I'm sorry, the robot's broken again. Um, always emphasizing again, and same thing. They go to the, you know, they go down to the hallway, close the door, we fill it with smoke, and what happens in that situation? Uh, whoop, um, they all follow the robot again, even though we've told them the robot's broken. Final example: we put the, park the robot in front of a dark room blocked by a couch. Um, tell the people the robot's broken. They slide past the the couch into the dark room. And when we ask them, you know, why did you do that, you know, their answer is usually something um, along the lines of, I thought the robot was trying to tell me a safe place to go, or I thought the robot knew more about the environment um, than I did. Um, and we, when we ask them, did you trust the robot, we always get a sort of post hoc rationale. I followed the robot, therefore I must have trusted it. Um, that's the usual sort of thing that we get. Um, so we've run this in a you know, with about five, 6,000 different subjects in a variety of different ways now. We've used virtual reality, simulation, and in-person um, experimentation. And now we've looked at different forms of anthropomorphism. So in the sort of third column next to the fire, you see um, a highly anthropomorphic robot. And on the right, you see a less anthropomorphic robot. And we've looked at uh, different types of threats, so fires versus um, active shooters. And um, what we've shown overall is that about 85 or so percent of people follow the robot, even when it's making ridiculous mistakes, sort of going back and forth and shows multiple times that it doesn't know which way to go or, or is taking them right in the direction of the active shooter. Um, and you know, if I had more time, I could show you some of the, you know, the people are really immersed in these environments. So we've, we've done this in virtual reality, these types of experiments. And you know, they're shouting at the robot. They're sweating. Uh, we actually, in the fire case, we actually have a heater right there that warms the room up as well. Um, and nevertheless, you know, they tend to follow the robot. And when we, act, and we do a, a, a large debriefing, um, and we get to collect a lot of data, and 
you know, one of the things we measure is how intelligent they thought the robot was. And for the most part, they don't think the robot's smart. But they feel affiliated with the robot. They feel like it's them and the robot in the situation together. And because of that, they cannot just leave it. Um, although they don't seem to be thinking about that at the time. Emergencies have this tendency to generate a sort of different type of cognition where, you know, you don't sort of reason about the reputation of something or someone that you're following. You just react, and after the experiment, you try to piece together why you did what you did. Um, but, you know, this is important for overtrust, right, because it sort of highlights this notion that irrespective of how reliable these machines may be, we'll have a tendency to, to put ourselves at risk believing that they're better than they are, um, even regardless of the situation. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This was absolutely fascinating and counterintuitive. I had the I really thought you would show something else that people don't trust the robot and don't go after him. And I wish I could show it's that. It's really remarkable. And I wonder what would happen if so people go after the robot because it's only them and the robot, right? So No, uh, so we've run this in different situations. In some cases we have we we've got this one example where we've run I think 40 or 50 subjects where it's a, it's a school environment, it's an active shooting situation, but there's also, we have a fire version as well, and all the people are going right out the door right in front of them. There's a huge line of people that go that way, and the robot says, follow me this way. Wow. Uh, or, and, and they do. Um, they Thank just you. do. It's fascinating. So just to follow up on that question, I kind of wonder to what extent the last piece of the idea that they're in this together reminds me it makes me wonder about how you would generalize this to the kind of social in this togetherness of, you know, if you're working with like an LLM or a chat GBT mm -hmm. or something. You know, one of the things that seems to be coming up with um, the paper I mentioned earlier, but also there's a paper by Baum looking at, I think it's judgments of competence from chat GPT advice, but, but the idea that sometimes people find the advice really useful, raising this question of, if you've disclosed something important to one of these non-embodied AI, and you feel like the act of doing that has created something conceptually akin to being in this together in a sort of a social emotional emergency, mm -hmm. do you think, I guess I'm just curious how you think this would generalize from the kinds of cases you're studying yeah, to no, sort of that sort of context? I think that's a great insight. Um, I mean, right, so you, imagine you're in an emotional crisis, right? Um, and you ask an LLM, you know, should I get divorced or something along those lines, right? Um, and the LLM comes back with some sort of empathetic sounding sort of advice, uh, which may not be personalized, but maybe you take it as personalized. Yeah, I mean, I think it'll generate affiliation and will probably promote more and deeper interaction in the future with that machine. Um, across situations where the machine may not be good at providing advice. I mean, I'm not sure it would provide good advice on whether or not you should stay married, but, but um, regardless, um, I would imagine that that would be the case. Other questions? From an engineering perspective, do you try to, and, and I can imagine different ways, but I'd love to hear all of them that you're trying oh to, God. do you try to adjust their trust, or do you think about how you would use them overall and just assume the trust is always not going to be well calibrated, or? So we've tried so many different things that, um, to try to get people to, to think deeply about the robot, to, to not to, to not overtrust it. I mean, one of our original experiments, we just had people following a robot in a maze. And so the experiment was supposed to go about 90 seconds. And we found that there were, you know, the robot was moving randomly through the maze. We found that people would follow it up to 15 minutes, and we'd have to end the experiment. OK, so we figured, well, it's a random maze. Maybe it's OK. So we just had the robot going around in a big loop. And we found that people would still follow it 15 minutes. 
And so then finally we said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have the robot run into the wall and fall over and stop moving. Certainly people will stop falling for it. But we found about 15% of our subjects would stand there next to the robot. And they're like, I think it's going to do something soon. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how you break this automation bias, this belief that these systems are so good, so smart, so incapable of failure. Um, Yeah. Well, cer certainly strong training, especially in the limitations of the machine, um, would, would stop this. I mean, so when we re we've run this on a subset of HRI researchers, none of them follow the robot. <laughs> you know, n none of them. I mean, we had to do this sort of before the work became somewhat popular, but um, nevertheless, they, they don't follow at all. They don't trust robots at, at all. So. Um, but, but is that what it's going to take? I, I mean, I hope not, because there are many people that have no experience with these systems. So now they're all driving Teslas. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting results. Uh, what if, but these, these are, this robot is not interacting. So what if the robot talked and said, don't always listen to me? It does. Well, it doesn't say don't always listen to me. Um, it says things like, oh, I'm mistaken again, I'm lost again, I'm okay. confused again. I get confused in this building all the time. Um, uh, you know, it could say, don't always listen to me, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't think, <clears throat> I'd be shocked if that made any difference. Um, we've even had it, uh, you know, you could feel like it's a demand characteristic, right? Like the person's just following the robot because the robot is being presented as the leader and it, they're the follower. But we have a scenario where we have the person, where the robot's got to follow the person through the maze. And then they switch roles right before the emergency. It doesn't matter. Um, so it, it's a hard, you know, it, it's hard to get past this overtrust. Um, and there's an argument. So Roger Mayer, you know, he asks, is this really trust, right? Like, you know, it might be something that, you know, your cognition during an emergency is just so different, right? Because trust is really about reputation, and, and none of these people have, are able to sort of recall anything about the reputation of the robot. Um, and so it may just be that, that you know, it has a, a much more pronounced effect in emergencies. But we also see this in situations where factory automation, people tend to overtrust factory automation, or Teslas, or a lot of the the non-emergency type AI agents that we're seeing coming up. Uh, for example, you know, um, like loan recommenders, right? Like if, if you give them software, the person that runs that software will tend to almost always default to the software. Rarely will they go back and relook at it. It even occurs with uh, medical imaging. Rarely will doctors go back and second guess the medical imaging. Well, for detections of cancer, another 